to the computer. Okay, please say yes, everybody. Right. Okay, so to go back, um, we are working for with our technical system, and that's why I've done it all separately from the younger grades, is because I'm looking at it specifically from the exam perspective. Okay, that narrows it down a bit rather than just doing everything. Now, if you look at the set of questions, they draw on two things mainly. Uh, they draw on your background and they draw on the technical aspects. Okay, so there's, there's got to be equal weightage given to both. I really would appreciate if all of you would put your cameras on. Um, there has to be equal weightage to, because I don't know if you'll understand stuff or not, so it becomes important. Uh, equal weightage to the background research, your author's lives, the time periods, the character research, uh, the language that is used in the material. You know, there's a piece, there's a, a document that I've given you over a period of time called appreciation of pieces. There's a little bit of a document. I'll send it again. Just remind me of all the things that we need to say. Okay. So uh, appreciation of pieces I'll put on all three groups. That talks about imagery, writing, all that, the actual background that you need to sort of understand uh, to be able to perform your piece well. If you don't have a good understanding of all that, there will never be a richness and a layering to your performance. It will be very two-dimensional. And that's what happens most of the time, okay? Some people can fool the examiner and the audience with very live background work. It's happened over a period of time, I've noticed it. If you want to take a chance and do that, that's fine. But then it becomes all about just doing the exam and not the actual learning. To love what you're doing, to love your pieces, you really need to sort of know what, you know, is the cottoning around that particular piece. Because it doesn't stand, even the poems, you know, I mean, monologues very definitely don't stand on their own. They have the play, they have the other characters and things like that. But even the poems don't stand on their own because they stand against the backdrop of their period. So if if someone like Louis Matisse is writing prayer before birth, against the backdrop of the industrial revolution and things that are going on and, and the fact that we've become so hard and the world wars have affected us. So we don't understand that. We don't understand what Louis Matisse has been through. It kind of falls into a vacuum. So you must pad your performance with all this research, okay? And of course, then, once you've understood the research and you've understood your piece within that context, you then have to analyze your performance technique, which means very often record your performances, observe it, and then see, tick mark the boxes. You know, again, we've given you criteria for um, good communication. If you remember grade five technicals, uh, breathing, posture, relaxation, pause, pace, phrase, emphasis, volume, literally tick mark it. But tick market going through the whole piece and going through it compared. So comparison and working for variation within the pieces plus the variation comparison between the pieces. So it can't be just sort of, you know, constants. In the beginning, you know, when she's got sort of getting upset and remembering her child and things like that, that's one thing. But when she's facing and she's mocking, um, the cardinal, you know, that's sort of another part. So within the piece, there is variation. So how do the eyes differ? How do the, the movements differ? What is your body language? That, what's the difference in your voice? Is there a difference in pacing? Is there a difference in emphasis? All these things come in. So literally step by step, analyze each piece and your performance. Deanne, I think one of the best things for you, which will be a little hard, is to go back and look at the play that you did or the little movie that you did with uh, Johan, look at that and do a very, very critical analysis of that. Because then you see yourself as a performer. And it doesn't matter how the director has, you know, given you the instructions. How did you actually bring yourself and bring your performance in? And that needs to be understood very, very clearly. So again, I repeat, record yourselves, watch yourselves, and then go ahead and do it. I think you need to do that for you now, since you're kind of stuck with the rest of it. Um, so you've got that part of it, okay, so these two bits come in, then your performance culminates 
into a sort of a, a combined. There's you, there's background research, and there's the technicals, and all three. The Trinity needs to give a really, really good, wholesome, grounded performance that really needs to be worked on. Now, the background needs to be worked on by you. I cannot do that for you. The depth and the, the breadth and depth that you want to go through is your decision. Some people prefer breadth and some people prefer depth. Neither is wrong, neither is right. I mean, obviously there's balance, you need both. But then you go to depends on what, how your performance is going to be. And that becomes you because that's what you bring in of yourself into the performance. I hope all of you can hear me online. If there's any point in time you can't hear me, just let me know immediately. Okay, message it on the group or something so that people can read it because I may not keep an eye on the chat and stuff like that. Okay, so now just to quickly glance through the questions because they form the scaffolding around which we will be doing our uh, study. Uh, talk about the contrast in the writer's composer's approach to communicating with an audience. His language, his style, his creation of the character, all that. So you need to do all your background research there. And you bring in a very little bit of technical knowledge because then you sort of just talk a little bit about how you therefore performed it, bringing that in, okay? What choices did you make about the character's motivation in one of your performed pieces? This is a very interesting question, very often not uh, attempted by people. But if you look at this, it means really understanding your character. And this is can be done in everything. It doesn't have to be a drama piece. I would avoid poems because sometimes the way people be uh, I would avoid poems because sometimes the examiners are like, but where's the character? The poet and the poem become the character. But they don't like to look at it like that. So avoid it. You can do it with your prose piece if there's enough depth in that. So I suppose the drama pieces are the main ones you look at for this. In this, you need to see how the character reacts to every other <laughs> sorry, excuse me. Character in the game. Yeah? Oh, so dishes, please. Uh, thanks. Um, look at every other uh, character. And the, the main, the perform your character's reaction and relation with every other character and vice versa. Because that also affects how they're performing. Because, you know, I don't like you. I mean, for instance, and I'm going back to concert because that was the last one I did just now. I mean, yesterday, or more or less the last one. So I know, you know, Constance's reaction to, to Philip. And I mean, I went back, I read the, you know, synopsis of the play and stuff. I don't know if you did that. Because I really didn't know anything at that stage. Um, so you've got, uh, you know, King Philip, you've got the Cardinal there and what their history has been and stuff. And therefore, when she's directly talking to them, it's a lot of how she feels about them and how she knows they feel about her. So that sort of equation needs to come into the analysis. And again, then a little tinge of the technical aspect. Now, I would take questions, when I'm picking questions, take a balance of questions that will bring in the technicals, that will bring in the background, and will bring in your own reaction to things, okay? Uh, one of the things that, you know, in IB that you do a lot of uh, is called the process journal from day one. Now, we don't have, um, you know, we don't maintain a process journal, but if you could sit back and look and think about like one of the hardest things, which is finding the pieces. Why did it take us so long? The fact that you're not exposed to enough pieces. If you realize, I mean, eighth grade, at least you had a little bit of the seventh grade to look back on. Uh, my ATCL is having the hardest time because now they've seen all this and they don't quite know which to pick and choose. So. You need to then be able to analyze your own skills as a performer. What strengths and weaknesses do you have? What strengths would you like to develop further, use? This is my best. I want to showcase it. That's part one. Part two, this is a strength that I could get better at. That's the second one. And third, this is a bit, so for instance, like with uh, I, uh, Aisha uh, doing an Indian piece, 
is very important. So I've been thinking about it, and I was like, doesn't matter. We can I'm, I'm going to me uh, message uh, Eva, whatever, or message the people the bitter chocolate for ourselves today. Fancy and we have our so I'm going to just message. She'll say no, doesn't matter. But I want an Indianized version of one of these, or we Indianize one of them. That's the other option. Because I think she needs to push herself with that. This is her, you know, ultimate or penultimate. I mean, no, it has to be ultimate. There is an FTCM. Um, performing performance is a part of this exam. So you need to be able to decide where and how you want to push yourselves. Okay. So that comes in, and that with that in mind, your choice of pieces have to be. Uh, I enjoy doing these pieces, going back and looking at your reports. You did all that. At least some of you did. So use that in your thinking, in your analysis, in your understanding of yourself as an artist. Okay. Not many of you have had the opportunity of being on stage. Uh, you know, hopefully at some stage all of you get that. But look at just at least the exams as your your stage performances. All right, that became your stage. Uh, your platform. Uh, were there any challenges in combining vocal and physical techniques to realize the style and genre? So first, style and genre, why exactly we decided this is the style and genre? The AC is off. May I have to have a moment? Um, to, um, so you've got to identify and justify the style and genre of your piece. Okay? That is, again, something we tend, we just say, tend to decide this is the style and this is this genre and go for it. Justify it, at least to yourselves if it's not in the answer. Then look at um, the techniques, and this becomes your entire vocal techniques. Now focus on the vocal, but the vocal is supplemented by breathing. Well, breathing is vocal techniques, but space usage, movement, eye contact, all that is affected with and works with the um, this thing with the. Uh, your actual entire performance technique analysis. Okay, so bring those in also. That whole again, that whole sheet that I've given you that makes life very easy. How many of you have read the handbook? Doesn't matter. So now pick it up and we, we go, just go through it. Uh, Vishal, you take like just over an hour to do this. Yeah, it's I great. read it. Oh, you read it, no? yeah. yeah, I read it. As long as you have a good idea, you use those. You, that's a good guide on how to, you know, um, perform. Uh, how many of you have read it? Niharika, have you read the handbook? Or you still don't not have fully. It? I have it. I have it. Okay. Uh, but not fully. Yeah. Go through it. Meena, have you read it? Yeah. Okay. Pass, but not currently. Currently, I'll go through it. Yeah. Uh, Rama, so, that orange book, no? Meena, Meher, for all of you who are teaching, it's very important because it is a teacher's yeah. handbook. Orange book, no? Orange one. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have it and I've read it in the past, but currently I've not. I will. It's need good to, to sort of, it. you know, uh, remind yourself about all yes, this. Yes, yes. Um, how does the extract you performed in one of your pieces fit into the overall story plot up? Very important. Again, how did your character get here? What is her feeling? What is her reaction? Who else is on stage? This is a fairly straightforward thing, but again, here. You want to bring in a little bit more about the author and the background and the times. See, don't answer the question, what is this color? It's red. No, it's red, which happens to be a primary color. And with the background of blue and green on either side, it stands out more. If it had had a tinge of yellow, maybe it would have, like, that's how you annually put in your, your, your uh, entire experience into the conversation, okay? What skills have you developed most in preparation for today? Again, very technical. Uh, how did you apply them in your performance? And that you can go across the board with all your pieces. That becomes very easy. Literally one side, all four of your pieces or three of your pieces. The other side, all our criteria. Pace, page, power, power, you know, inflection, intonation, blah, blah, blah. And for each thing, you can literally say each thing and compare. Again, you can compare within the pieces and you can compare among the pieces, okay? Uh, talk about the process of staging your pieces, your imagined surroundings, and how you made your decisions. And this is our entire rehearsal process. From choice of material, 
the working rights with all the things you've been correcting about. You can start with articulation and say the standard were were mistakes that we made. I've done it for so many years, and yet when it comes back to it, I still I was you know horrified to see that I was doing that again. It's okay to say that, but make sure you're not doing it then. If you're admitting any mistakes in the question answer session, please make very sure that they're corrected because you, they'd be like, what are you talking about? You still have that problem. So you need to be very sure that those mistakes are corrected. Okay. That's grade seven. Now, when you look at grade eight, um, more or less the same. Uh, I'll talk about your, how you chose your pieces for today's performance and how you balance style, contrast, mood and style to contrast it. This also brings in your theme. This is very particular to grade eight. Why did you choose it? Did you work? I wouldn't be 100% honest about how we just like force fit and get the theme. Say I got, the, got two pieces that I really wanted to do. That's as honest as you're going to get, which is basically what we have done. Is I did the two pieces and then I got a vague idea of the theme and then, um, you know, I looked at it and went ahead with it. Some of you can now consider this is my, I thought of this theme and I looked and this didn't suit it and that. Talk about pieces you've not chosen in the eighth grade. That also makes it, you know, a little like that you actually read stuff and you can borrow from each other. Just go back to the list that I sent you or the choice of material. I've said my seventh to eighty CL. So just literally go through and say, I was going to do this, but I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do Alice because it was like this and blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'd done this in the sixth grade and I thought if I could get something similar. You know, bring all that in. Bring your history in here. Um, how did your understanding of the writer, genre, composer uh, influence your interpretation and, and performance? It's similar to the seventh grade question. How does the extract you performed fit into the story or plot arc? Same. Uh, what have you learned about your own strengths and limitations during the preparation? Again, it's a technical analysis of your work and a little bit of a historical drawback. You can talk about cold-blooded murder. You can talk about, you know, dangerous beauty. What not? Rose is dangerous beauty. Okay, so then cold blood and murder. Uh -huh. You've done. Okay. Well, whatever. Uh, Juliet. Yeah. So you talk about you know all that. Think back. Think back to flat and flying fish and whatever else you all may have done in the initial grades. Also, um, I said that because I've done that. Okay. Um, how have you developed your physical and vocal skills? Same thing. Uh, how did you prepare yourself physically and emotionally for your performance today? A bit tricky. Because you've got to talk about your own experiences also in life and be honest about it. So, for instance, if you picked a piece, then why is the AC? Talk about, uh, you know, supposing you picked up a piece that talks about self harm. Where you start, or if you know someone who's done it, or you've been impacted by something. You know, bring that out, talk about these things. It's very important because your own emotional development is something we look for in these performances, okay? Um, physically and emotionally, physically, especially voice, you know, deeper voice, higher voice. So for instance, Ayo, she's not here, but she's doing Chitra, so is Kirti. And they're both doing it marvelously differently. It's amazing to see how they're both looking at the same character. There are some similarities, basic similarities. I mean, you can't, it is the same person. And you can see it's the same person. But other than that, it ends there. Um, so sort of see all, all that coming in and how they've been differentiated them, their movements, their positioning, their uh, voices, the, the reaction that Chitra had is very different in the two. And that comes from their own way of looking at things, okay? So you need to look at that. Um, okay, in ATCL, I'm not going through it, uh, but if you sort of look at it, it's a combination of all, any ATCLs here. Uh, on screen, we've got uh, Meena is there. Who else is ATCL here? Neharika's, yeah. Neharika's, Riddhi is here. Um, okay. So if you sort of look at uh, 
you know, all the questions that are there, personal responses, challenges, and reflection, uh, what skills were needed to approach the challenge, what choice of interpretation and things. Now, one of the things I realized why the ATCL questions are framed like this is because the stupid ATCL questions apply to common skills also, which kind of limits the way you can phrase a question if it's got to apply to speech and drama and communication skills. So I think at the ATCL level, you can you can extend the questions to adapt it to what you would like to kind of talk about. My suggestion for ATCL students, read the questions through at least six or seven times. I am not joking. Spend an hour just reading and rereading and rereading the questions. Okay, uh, that will give you an idea of what you need to do you know, for all this. Another part that comes into ATCL is health and safety, which doesn't come in the other grades. Health and safety. Um, there's a page I've sent it to you, all of you on the group, that health and safety page separately, besides the fact that it's in the syllabus. But you will look at all three aspects of health and safety. One, physical safety, so for instance, over here, we have little, on the wall over here, we've got little hooks. Uh, little kids could bang their heads and you know get quite a wound over there. So that's not the safest of things. As the, and those of you in AT who are teaching, use your teaching experiences. Talk about how you know, kids may have slipped or, or uh, you know, they scream or they, you know, they're not, that comes to voice safety. But go sort of look at all the physical aspects of where plug points are, where wires are, our props, our costumes, the fact that we need to rehearse with our costumes beforehand. Very often we go for the exams with just one costume rehearsal. I would like from those of you who are going for the exams end of September, beginning of October. So you and I, we need to start working with our costumes. Perform with the costumes. It's very, very important to be able to do that. Okay, so that part is uh, sort of uh, looked at with this physical safety. Hair. Um, I had kids who tried to take things out of their head during the exams and they it didn't come off, so they got frustrated. They actually yanked out bits of their hair. And I'm like, you know, in the clip, those little hair clips that are there, something they got stuck and they're not used to using those clips. So they finally just like, like did that. So if they didn't yank it out of their head, they actually broke their hair. So they have like a tuft of you know, short hair in the middle of their heads. So these are the things you need to be very well practiced with. Shoes, no slipping on floor. This floor can get quite slippery with certain shoes. So practice with it. Put rubber uh, bases if needed so that you don't slide out. You don't make noise. That's the other thing. So when you're looking at health, you're looking at a lot of the health of the performance also overall. Then you're looking at voice and that's big. You can go like beyond, like really look and research voice health for theater artists and teachers. We speak for so long. We get what's known as teacher's voices, little nodules on our vocal cords. So be careful because I've already got them. So, you know, you don't want to be uh, extending with this. So just be a little, uh, you know, find out about these things. Um, those of you who were with Vivant or Akhya last time, the examiner wrote that it's very dangerous the way, and he had here during the performance over here. Uh, Vivant's not, oh, he's Vivant skills. Yeah. Um, he, I hope he doesn't mind my sharing this, but you know, while he was doing the performance here, he was trying so hard to get into the piece that he used his voice to do that. And then it kind of cracked. And because I went back and looked at his performance and that's what had happened. So if you try very hard to perform, which can happen to you also a little bit in, in uh, the poem. Yeah, no, and even for having happened more there. So these are the things we need to be very careful about. We do our exercises, understand our exercises, why we do it. There's so many more voice exercises on the net. Look it up. You know, um, hydrate your voices. Now, if you drink water just before your performance, it's a waste. It'll give you a very brief 
sense of relief, but it won't hydrate you. The hydration comes from the water being absorbed by the body. You need to take that kind of time. About half an hour before the performance or about 40 minutes before the performance, have a good half a glass of water so that you can also pee before you go for the exam. And that's what actually lubricates your throat. Honey, honey, not just before again, it gives a very gruff voice, but honey, water, lime a little bit, again, about 40 minutes before the exam. Uh, the, the night before having halvi dood, those who can't drink milk, haldi water, that's very, very um, rejuvenating. Because remember, turmeric is an antiseptic, so it's very good for your throat. So now, like, for instance, yesterday and today, I will have halvi. I literally just need to sit in the honey stool and have it because I can't be bothered to sit and do anything else. But that does help because otherwise, and it gives you a little bit of, you know, good energy also for your performance. So these are the little things you need to look at. Uh, and then you need to look at emotional health. A lot of you are doing pieces. I mean, she is being about, you know, mother killing your children. Each one of us is doing something. You're usually Cassandra here. Uh, Mayor is doing Cassandra. She's mad. She can prophesy and see herself. Can you imagine being raped, but being able to see yourself being raped over and over and over again? There's no, I mean, how much is she being punished? Somebody is doing uh, Mala, Binami, I think, uh, is doing Mala, confronting your mother about being. Um, you know, abuse at home and within that context. If you really allow yourselves to get immersed in the pain and the situation of your character, your performances will be very good. But what will your emotional health be? So you need to have someone you can talk to about these things. Someone who you're comfortable with and can chat about it. You know, a lot of times, a lot of our own, um, you know, uh, I've had people in this span of time come up and talk about how intensely they've been bullied as young people. I've had people come up and talk about the fact that they've, you know, let themselves go, uh, been used by other people in their efforts to try and make others happy. And, you know, it, it goes the gamut. It goes from spending money on them to you know, stretching themselves and getting tired, putting themselves down to, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, sexual, it's sort of like it goes literally the entire gap. And you'd be amazed at how much, how much the younger kids have done. I'm talking about my seventh graders this time. So what I want you all to understand is that these things, when you perform all this, it does pull it out of you if you're doing it properly. But then it's really good because it's cathartic for you but don't let it pull you down, okay? So look for voice exercises to help you, for drinks and things like that that will help you improve your voice safety and look at uh, emotional, uh, you know, uh, strength in your performances. Got it? Okay, good sleep, very important. I'm just saying it because she's gone. All right, I'm lubricating my voice. Right. That's the overall umbrella of what you are expected to do. 7th, 8th and ATCL. And at every level, it's got to get deeper and more intense and broader. Okay? Now let's go to the actual technicals. You all have it. Uh, let's start with the basic and the most important. It really is the most important technique. Pause. Um, you all understand pause. Can you give me an example right now of your pieces where pausing has changed the way you performed it? Anybody? My piece will be very uh, evident for change of emotion when uh, she says, "Okay, now I'm going to kill them by poisoning them," and then she some, and then there's this very long pause. And the thought and the emotion shifts, and then she she's you know drowning in the emotion. Uh, this was Disha. I don't know how many of you heard her. Were you able to hear Disha? Okay. Um, those of you, uh, if when again when you can't just just speak up. 
or come forward and speak or something like that. Or maybe you can come forward a little bit anyway. Take the you over here, not that. So that it's easier for everyone to sort of. So Disha was saying that, especially the part where she talks about killing her child and then moves towards uh, the poison and then so the, the poison and then the grief of the children. You know how she's going to kill the husband and the and the father-in-law. Uh, can you come here? Just get the chair. Over. Um, you know. Uh, so when you sort of. Uh, you know, they have to have that complete change and then she talks about killing her children and all. So the pause there becomes her emotional pause. Okay. Um, I'll just tell her, I got the message about my uncle. I will call her back. Is it okay if I call her back at 9 30? Was that too late? I mean, thanks. Okay, thank you. Are you allowed to read out the number again? Okay. Now, uh, so that becomes. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so that becomes an emotional pause. Uh, you have pauses. What are the reasons we pause? Not not to, to breathe the, correctly. Not to make the piece too monotonous. To change the monotony of the piece to break it. For to make more sense. To have a flow in the speech. To have a flow in the speech, yeah. So, so now this is like it's a juxtaposition to have a flow in the speech and yet not to be monotonous. So then again, it becomes a question of balance. How do you use it? Where do you use it? So you've got to be very, very aware. Analyze your pieces. See where you're actually pausing and why you're pausing in these particular pace, places. Okay. So to recap, a pause is a break in the flow of speech occurring between phrases. A group of words, okay, to make sense, occurring between phrases. Was she okay? I mean, did she say the He said he's absolutely fine. Um, and she said she was going to tell the woman, and he said, No, tell the woman, don't tell her anything because she's fine. She doesn't have to talk. Thank you. Uh, where was that? Yeah. Uh, to uh, breathe correctly. No, where was that? To, uh, occurring, in between phrases. occurring between phrases and at the end of sentences. Make sure your pauses occur between phrases. Yeah, today I was reading something and I you know, stopped two, two words earlier. And then that's one of the biggest mistakes in sight reading because it makes sense why you're reading that much. And then these two words are supposed to go with the very tend to pause. And then you sort of join it in with the next phrase where it makes no sense. So that's why your eye needs to be ahead of the words. That's why a lot of sight reading practice needs to be done for a good performance. Because if your eye is ahead of the words, you know exactly where to pause to mark the phrase to keep the sense. Okay? So, um, pause is a break in the flow of speech occurring between phrases and at the end of sentences in order to breathe correctly, read fluently, keep the meaning clear. Then you've got the different types of pauses. You've got a grammatical pause, which is to make sense. Uh, emotional pause to give the emotional context. The length of the pause can vary depending on what you're doing. So it can be like between three more words, tup, 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 or it can be tup, tar, tup. So it, again, it depends so completely. So you've got to say why you're pausing like that there in the explanation. Okay. Um, so grammatical, uh, rhetorical. Parenthetical, of course. Parenthetical, very often, I find, is a pause that we underuse because we actually look for the physical bracket in your performance. But a lot of it is an aside. So be that as it may. And then she comes on. So that's a bit of an aside to then connect it to the next. As well, yeah. Okay, you know, but that again has the actual brackets. Yeah, but in other places, places then. So there are a lot of places where the, it has the impact of the parenthetical pause. That phrase or that sentence just is there to elaborate or connect something else. But it's not there in the actual flow of speech. So that those parenthetical pauses need to be very clear. Your inflection in a parenthetical pause changes. You know, the way you say is that da -da -da -da, or da -da 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 -da, okay?
Um, yeah, so the parenthetical pause becomes important and uh, grammatical, emotional, parenthetical, and rhetorical. Rhetorical means not as in rhetoric, but in keeping the sense, in making sure that the whole package works together. Okay, so it's not just little bits and parts of the actual or the sentences, but the whole package that you must look at for rhetorical pause. These are the four pauses used in everything, but the poem pauses come because you've got lines. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking, if you're analyzing any aspect of your performance with poetry, please bring, bring in the verse pauses. So first of all is the end of line pause. If you remember earlier, for the, all of you, I think, when we did pause, I did not mention end of line pause. And what I realized is most of you didn't understand that. That at the end of every line of poetry, there is a pause. That's what marks the end of line. Okay? Then the other three come in relation to those lines. So you've got scissorial pause where you pause, you know. Whatever I do, pause. Whatever I say, pause. So there's an in-between scissorial pause, and then there is an end of line pause. Now, when the end of line pause is not used, is when you then have your suspensory pause. Suspensory pause adds a lot of beauty to lyrical poems. A lot of sense to narrative poems, a lot of drama to dramatic verse, but it adds beautiful lyricism to lyrical poetry where we tend to leave it out because the normal rhythm and everything goes. So we tend to sort of leave that part of it out. So we don't want to do that. Okay, make sure you're using the suspensory pause where it's needed. Some people use suspensory pause when there's an actual punctuation mark. Please don't do that. It can be a short pause, but it has to be a pause. Now know that the suspensory pause is marked. What is it marked by? Invoice. What, what technique do we use to show the suspensory pause? Is it upward inflection? Yes. It's the upward inflection of your voice to mark the end of the line. But then you continue into the next line to preserve the sense. So there is a marking of the, up, of the suspensory pause. Okay? And then you've got the isochromous pause. There is somebody who's doing the poem where, oh, uh, Ayushi, Garden of Eros. The isochromous pause becomes very difficult to maintain because there's actually a suspensory pause from one verse to the next. So, but she still has to keep, and she's doing it very intuitively without realizing it. Uh, and I don't think I'm going to, I haven't talked to her about it, but um, you know, when she was performing it yesterday, it sort of struck me that you do use and you do mark the isochromous pause, keeping in mind the suspensory nature of that line. So you need to, so the length of the pause and the upward inflection that comes in as a result is very important, okay? So the, if you really understand your technicals, you will get, I mean, like I said, you do it very naturally. Record yourselves and then go back and analyze all this. Which is why it takes 120 hours to do your background work for uh, seventh grade, eighth grade, eighth and CM. If you actually did all this, you would need the 120 hours. Okay, but do a little bit of it at least. Okay? I would say if you don't do it this year, you've got the time to do it. Um, right, so you've got that pause. What's the next thing? Phrase linked to it. Okay, actually, the next thing in third grade is emphasis. Yeah, but we are going to go with phrase because phrase sort of links in with pause. Very similar, but phrase is more predominantly sort of there to make sense. It is to give you time to breathe. Please understand breath control is very, 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 very important. You heard just now I did very, very, very important because I did not have my breath control at this stage. So you do need to make sure your breath is well regulated. So you need to do your breathing exercises. Build up your, your capacity as much as you can. And then develop your control. It will help you with phrasing a lot. See, the technicals are interconnected. It's not like, you know, 
one bit, uh, you know, you do your ABCD and then the words just come from somewhere else. They're all connected. So make sure that that happens in your interpretation of the uh, technicals, okay? So you've got the phrasing. Uh, of course, take the, the definition of phrase is a group linking together of words by their meaning. It makes sense, but not complete sense. It is a punctuation of the ear rather than that of the eye. It has to sound correct. Every punctuation of the eye, you have to pause. Okay, that's your phrase given to you by the author. But there are times, very often, that you pause where the punctuation mark is not given. So you need to do the punctuation of the ear. Does it sound right? Okay, so um, phrases linking together words by their meaning, it makes sense but not complete sense. Punctuation of the ear rather than of the eye. It helps you read correctly, read so it can bring out the full clear meaning of sense. You see, I done like this. I need you all. I think some of you could do that no? at this stage, or if I ask when you're 40 years or 50 years old, I think you will be able to say it back. At least these four, four things pause, phrase, emphasis, emphasis, and pace. Okay, so let's go to the next one emphasis. I need to move a little faster. Um, what is why is emphasis important? That's what is emphasis giving, a, giving importance, not stress. Giving importance to a word, bringing out the significance of a syllable, word, or phrase. Please remember all three. Okay, so let's do it first. Syllable. Why is emphasis important for syllables? If you need an X partner. So, say for example, I say like expert, you can say X. You emphasize X, okay, in that way, right. Well, in that respect, X is not really a syllable. Yeah. As a, it's, it's a broken, it's a hyphenated word. Take a word like opportunity. How do most of you say, and I hear, really? I say it as opportunity. I will record it. Okay, comfort. How do you say it? Comfort. All saying it correctly today. But yesterday, I had everybody doing it wrong, yeah. uh, including Yesha sitting here. But three, four people, come forward, come forward. They neutralize come and they emphasize per. Okay? Emphasis is very important in the, if you look at this, the dictionary, okay, and we've done this very often. We've talked about this. When you look at the dictionary, it gives you the phonic breakup of the word, okay? And then next to one of the syllables, there'll either be a little dash or, I mean, a, 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 an apostrophe. No, no, what's it called? In the end. In the end, no, it's a little line, whatever it is. That's there. It may be underlined. It may be uh, bold. There are different forms that different dictionaries use. But one syllable is emphasized more because English is a tonal language. In Hindi, if I say, it makes no difference. It's exactly the same word. But in, in, in English, if I say beautiful, if I say beautiful, if I say beautiful, it's wrong. It's beautiful. Emphasis is on beau. You cannot change it. That's a part of your correct pronunciation. So emphasis is very important syllabically for pronunciation. Emphasis is important in word and phrase to give significance to the word or phrase. Because you as a performer want to draw the listener's attention to that set of words or phrases. And I corrected her. She said to give stress to a syllable word or phrase. Why did I say not stress? Because you might actually give emphasis the other way around, right? Like, don't do that. Did you hear? I didn't stress, you know, I, I may have stressed the volume, but I mean, oh, that was not a very good example. But what I'm trying to say is that there are times when you don't stress, you are stressing everything else, and then you don't stress on the part that you want to emphasize. Okay, so that, um, Bit is important. So you don't, don't say I want to stress 
on something. I want to give significance of uh, importance to that set of words or word. Okay, and of course, there are different techniques change your pace, pitch, power, force, emphasis. You've got the list, go through the technicals for that. I tell you, read the, the pieces that we've given you. So we've got, you all have these, okay? These are the newer formats that we've given you. So it has the old, you know, pause the break in the flow of speech, but I've rewritten it, which I think a lot of my teachers are now finding it hard because they all learned it in, in one particular way. You can keep your old notes. I'll send the old ones for the seniors if you all want. But you, you can learn it like that, but this actually explains it better. And this is what you've got to say. You can say it in your own words, but make sure you're covering every point and understanding it. And then read the handbook. I have incorporated the handbook stuff also into this, but I would appreciate your reading it the way Trinity has framed it. It becomes important to look at it in the way they frame it to understand things. Because then a good communicator tries to understand their audience. Let's be honest at this stage, your audience is the examiner. So if you can understand where they're coming from, it makes your life, you know, halfway, half the battle is won with that. Emphasis is done. Let's go to pace. Um, can anyone give me the definition of pace? Pace is the rate at which we speak. Pace is, pace is the rate at which we speak. Then, anybody? Anybody? Really? I want to make you repeat it ten times. Pace is the rate at which we speak. Say it ten times. Ten, ten times. If I make you do this, we'll be here till uh, no, no, we'll be here till like five o'clock in the morning because then we have to do it for all our technicals. But guys, make sure that you really want pace is the rate at which we speak. Uh, you can go fast, you can go slow, very obvious. But how do you decide? If you want to go fast or slow. It depends on the idea that you're trying to communicate. And, and this becomes very important in communication skills besides speech and drama also. In our real life, this is a very, very important natural technique that we've got to keep in mind. Now, you never go so fast that you are unclear with the audience. And that does tend to happen. Because we tend to forget that the person in front you know, isn't used to us speaking. So Aisha's friends will understand Aisha brilliantly, but somebody say from, you know, Thailand may not quite understand. They'll be like, she speaks too fast. I love the fact that British examiners come here every year and say, you Indians speak so fast. I'm like, really? Have you heard yourself? Can we measure it syllable for syllable? You know, how many syllables said in how many in the minute? And that that would be they speak very fast. My kids have gone like I didn't understand you were speaking so fast. In BBC, it happens the same. BBC is terrible for that. Really, volume it's so fast the whole house. So high, uh, because yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's you. I've seen some amazing performances of Shakespeare. The set that I've got here, the BBC set of uh, Shakespeare that I've got. They speak at like breakneck speed in that those performances. If it didn't have um, captions, I wouldn't be able to follow it. It's just like really weird to see. And these are renowned performers. So, but they're used to it and everybody hears them and everybody, you know, Dame Judy Dench can, can speak at the speed of lightning and everybody like, oh, wow, because they're just so used to her. Oh, she doesn't hear me saying this. She normally not too fast. So that's, that's all right. But you've got to be careful. It shouldn't be too fast that you're not clear and it should never. So it has to be balanced. If you look at this, any part of your technicals and techniques have to be well balanced. Keep in mind the various things that you're doing. So you may want to show an emotion and you may want to like, you know, uh, overdo the pace. Like, come back, come back, come back. But it also be, come back, come back. So you give the feeling of saying it fast. 
but be very clear articulate open your mouth give the give the the consonant sounds absolute clarity you can go as fast as you want because then people will understand what you're doing so if you notice what i'm doing now is speaking really quick but i'm opening my mouth and using my consonant sounds clearly because i'm running out of breath in the process so again go back to the fact that all our technicals are interlinked show that in your responses okay uh, so your yeah, base is decided by the idea and emotion that you are trying to show also by the character so if it's an older character this there's a tendency to slow down a bit if you're a character who's um got you know certain disabilities you may you may slow down a bit if you're a character who uh, uh, you know um older with disability all sorts of you know things like like really think uh, depending on who, you know what the, the class background of that character is the status of that character so the age the status uh, all these things play a role in deciding your character and the pace you're going to use overall so there is an overall pace so for instance uh, gift of the magi no let me take lastly by o henry is slower um i'm trying to think about piece that go really fast prose piece anybody with a prose piece that excitation launching is snappy goes quicker okay so that that goes faster the in comparison lastly will be slower Okay, so you've got both these sort of things which keep that. That's the overall piece. That doesn't mean that in the long term there aren't parts where you're like, oh my god, this woman's a nutcase. Like you go slow. So there is variations within, and then there is the overall pace that you need to look at and decide. Got it, darling? Okay. So uh, that's your four basic techniques, which are very very important. They lay the foundation. If you can work well with these four, I'm honestly telling you, eighty percent of your job is done. Where and whether vocal performance is concerned, okay, and the expressions and things like that, not movement, but at least that part of it is well said. Then you go on to the next thing, which is let's just quickly look at inflection and intonation, and I know everybody hates that part of it. Most teachers hate that. But it's actually not that difficult. Inflection is a movement of pitch. Okay. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. If you take a tuning fork and listen to it, that's what it is. For those of you who remember your physics, okay, that's your frequency. Keisha, look at Keisha making eyes. She has done it. So this is why I want cameras on because then I know that people understand what I'm saying. Um, but. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking and carried away. Sorry. Um, they'll also be able to hear me better now. Uh, yeah. So inflection is the pitch, and inflection is more or less decided based on the meaning of what you're saying. There is a certain amount that comes in with emotion, but it's the meaning behind what you're saying. So, for instance, we go sit down. It's a command. Sit down. It's a question. So you, the minute you change the the meaning behind this, it's the same words. The minute you change the meaning, you change the inflection. Okay, and that's why in a suspensory pause, there's an upward inflection towards the end because you know if you look at it, simple, simple rising, unfinished statements, right? So. Suspensory pause is to mark the unfinished statement to bring it back to completing it, which is why you don't wait, but you bring up the inflection to mark the unfinished statement and go on to your finished statement, which is your injabment. Okay, when you run over the line for injab, is that clear to everyone? Okay, I'm not using any teaching aids and techniques just now. I'm just talking because I'm hoping that that will. Work today, okay? Um, so that's uh, the the whole inflection. Of course, there are different types of inflections. The simple rising, simple falling, compound rising, compound falling. Simple rising and falling. I've actually given you all really clear things. You know, 
or prayers, commands, unfinished statements, questions that can be answered by yes or no. So just read your notes. That's very clear there. Compound rising and falling, you can like not really worry about. That comes with practice as you're performing. And of course, there's the flat inflection, which comes uh, because you know there is no change in your tone. That's your, uh, sorry, in your pitch. And that's normally chanting. It's not praying, it's chanting. Or whatever everyone says. Everyone has to way of saying it. But that's true. Your chanting requires a flat. It's the only thing that actually requires a flat inflection. Otherwise, there is always movement in inflection. On the other hand, and different, is intonation. Intonation is something that stays almost the same throughout the entire piece. Because intonation is uh, about the background of the piece. So if you are doing a very British, now this is one word you all have to remember, received English, R-E, received English. What we tend to do is most of our performances have received English. Even when we are doing American pieces, there's a strong tendency for us to keep it closer to received English because we're not very good at, I'm not very good at adjusting accents and I need to hear it very often. I mean, even when I'm doing this in Ezekiel and I switch from soap in Gujarati to uh, uh, goodbye party uh, in which I wanted to be South Indian, but if I do soap first, goodbye party of mine comes with the Gujarati accent. Yeah, I have a chain. You make my life a little easier. Um, so, Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm going to sit if necessary and bring this down a bit. Yeah, so um, if you look at sort of uh, Disha, can you see me then? I'm going to come forward. Uh, so if you look at uh, intonation, is the overall movement of voice. But which part of the voice? Now it's not pitch. Now it's note. The tune. The sare gama. The do re mi. So it's the tune of the language. And this is a very, very important uh, component of accent. Intonation is not equal to accent. It's a part of accent. Can anybody tell me what else is there in accent which you would have? The rhythm. Okay. The rhythm, which is intonation. The inflection of the end. Not necessarily. That's more with meaning. Well, then you, it, that plus, I would... I what very important. What is enunciation. Enunciation. Uh, the pronunciation. There are certain ways we pronounce things differently. That brings you your, gives you your accent. Your, uh, your stressing, your use of power, variation in use of power of the words is something that, you know, is part of the accent. So what I would, Intonation is like the most important component because that's what you bring in. So for instance, Indians, because of our sort of constant usage and hearing of the Indian languages, we speak with the Indian intonation. We speak English with the Indian intonation. It's not wrong. It just gives it variation. We do that whether we're speaking French or, or German or anything. Okay, if you learn it well, the impact of it will be reduced. Now, a lot of people say, oh, you speak with an accent. I don't. I speak with the Indian accent. I speak with the received English pronunciation and received English emphasis, syllabic emphasis. Because you've got to have the correct pronunciation. I mean, that's what we are all here for at the end of the day with, you know. It may be speech and drama, but speech component requires that you pronounce things correctly, emphasize the words correctly. So that part of it. So you have the received English, but you have the Indian sing-song intonation. I mean, you get the sing-song intonation. Even while I'm saying that, there's the, the musicality that comes in. Whereas when you hear the British, they're very flat in their intonation. Doesn't mean they don't have an up and down inflection. Because they're showing the emotions, they're showing the meaning. But their intonation is flat, their musicality is flat. 
the Americans tend to have a step down. They would have da, 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 da. You know? That's sort of like the American intonation. Don't ask me what the Australian intonation is. I'm not figured it out. I'm sure there is, but I've just not figured it out. Even in the Indian intonation, I've noticed a lot of my children who come from, say, Maharashtra backgrounds have a sharper intonation movement. The Gujaratis tend to like really roll. It's not really a wave, but it's like a wave with a little curve in different directions. So you have all that. Uh, you know, everybody's intonation, even within India, varies a lot. So you've got all that coming, okay? So there's inflection and intonation. But also, this piece of paper becomes very, very important. Everybody. Okay? All the various criteria and aspects for accomplished verbal communication. It's in very brief, everything that's there in your handbook. This is what to so touch on all this. How did I change my volume? Why did I change my volume? Where did I put in more power? So when you're doing the analysis of your pieces, so you need to know clearly what is volume. We've never really done the definitions of each of these, but you do need to be able to explain it. So the amplitude, the loudness and the softness of the voice. Okay, what do we use for the loudness and softness of the voice? What organs of articulation or what part of our body? Always said to use and we always advised us to use the diaphragm. The diaphragm be the originating part for the power that you will give, whether it's intensity, whether it's force, or whether it's volume or pace. I know. But good. Yeah, so you start with the diaphragm. But where, where does it actually get amplified? You see me just saying it, amplified. It's either the vocal mouth. Yeah, and your oral cavity, it hits. Who is doing physics here? All my, my science uh, engineers. I need all of you to explain this and that in those terms to everybody. But that's the part. You have to so be aware of these things. So over here, I've given you a very brief list. But you need to go into more depth on your own and understand these things. Okay? Because then you know what to use. Others just loud, they're like, I'm being loud. And that's jarring. I'm being loud. The minute I sit up, my diaphragm is clear. I can get the breath correctly into the organ for amplitude. Okay? So volume, pitch, pace, power. Um, you've got intensity. Tones are deep tones, middle tones. Again, where do we get? We do the action. Beautiful. 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 We use action. Voice, please understand very importantly, is a biological, what we call a physiological process. But we cannot train it completely, you know, mechanically. Because a lot of it is psychological okay. uh, it's very psychological so you've got to make yourself think that so very often the root of doing that and this is when you talk about your rehearsal process and things is the route that i took to get there was uh, you know, I thought of my character and I thought of her as being elegant. And the minute you're elegant, my pitch went higher, my my tone went a little higher, my consonants sounds and my vowel sounds also got more refined, more controlled, leaner. So you need to be aware. Like again, go back to it. Record yourselves, watch it, then do the analysis. It's really interesting to see how your performances will change, and that these things really play such a, a beautiful part in our entire performances. Now, as a teacher over the years, I've actually learned this best because I've been teaching and I was like, oh, over here. So when I'm trying to teach someone, I'm like, oh, this is actually what I'm trying to teach. Let me tell you, you can ask Gurvi, she was my first ATCM. I bombed with her because I didn't understand everything fully. The more experience I got as a teacher. So the ATCL 
that Uri's did and the ATCL that we're doing now, heaven and the earth's difference. Because I've kind of gotten to, I didn't even have this list when Uri's was there. I've like made it over a period of time and things like that. So you need to start looking at all these things and being very, very aware. It has to be at the top of your mind. So you need to read the list over and over again with your pieces. What am I doing here? What am I taking there? So I've left the last a bit over here is resonance. Because resonance is a combination of all this. Resonance is the quality of your voice. So I can talk like this normally, or I can talk like this normally, or I can talk like this normally. Again, you change your tone, you change your pitch, you change your uh, force, you, there's so many things. So resonance is the overall quality of your voice, which becomes very important. Bring, even in your normal talking, try and be conscious of that. And you know what will really help you in this? Is sight feeling. Sight feeling every day in a way that this is the voice I'd like myself to normally have. So if I'm up there talking like that, nothing wrong with it. But especially if you listen to our fourth graders, they're all going like this and they're all performing like this. So whether they're angry, they're like, so whether they're sad, they're like this. But everything is like, hi, hi. And after that, I say, Boss, they can't hear it. And that's actually when I realized the importance of resonance and getting what I call a phonogenic voice. Get yourself within your own register. You are born with what you have. Your quality of your bones, unless you have osteoporosis and want to take action and things, but the quality of the bones, that's the material. The density of your bones is your own. The muscle, fat, tissue that you've got in your vocal organs is, you know, what you're born with. So you can't change that. But the best way to use it, you can. And the only way to do that is a tried and tested thing of experimentation, identifying something, practicing it. Go back. Experiment, identify, practice. I experiment, identify, practice. Okay, this sounded good. So now I'm going to do it just like that all the time. Then do it, let it settle in. The, maybe I could tweak it here. We did that a lot with Ariel, if you remember. Mm -hmm. you know, sort of moved it, came, and then in a way it was almost like, oh, you're coming back again to what we had done earlier. It wasn't coming back. It's a spiral. You start here, you come round here at a higher plane. Yeah. And then you're going round and then you come to a higher plane. So it may seem like you're at the same point, but you're at a different point of plane, mm -hmm. if you understand what I'm saying. So there is a variation that's happening in, in the performance and there is an evolution. And that evolution doesn't stop till the last day of your performance here. Okay? So keep pushing for that evolution and the, and the change to keep happening. Got it? So the quality of your voice, the resonance must be as uh, controlled by you as possible, which means like trying it out. And honestly, we do it with the kids sometimes. I don't know if you again, you remember when we did the exercise. Uh, so we make very funny noises. But we did it with that and did the vowel sounds with that, if you remember. Or at least somebody remembers these things. Um, because that gave you the variation to play around with and experiment it here and have fun with. Do that now. I mean, you know, when Mare did Lady Anne and Vinami did Lady Anne, completely sort of different. And today, who else is doing Lady Anne just now? This year, Vidhi, I think, is doing Lady Anne. I'm not too sure. Vidhi, are you doing Lady Anne? Yes, I am. Anyways, I don't, I'm not too bad. Uh, I'm sure her performance will be different because the quality of her voice will also be different. Again, what you're born with and then adapting it to the performance. Mimics have learned to do that. They've learned how to control it, the out, control the output by experimenting and doing it, okay? So that's one of the, it's a great skill if you can. I'm a horrible mimic. Uh, I can't really mimic, but I, I try and, and develop my register as much as I can, like push tonally, force, you know, all these various aspects as much as I can for myself. Okay.
So that's all the things that you've got there. Now, all this starts with a triangulation time, promise. Uh, Diane's looking at the clock. Are you all asleep? Do you want a break? Do you all want a little bit of a break? Yes, no? No, then I'll continue because now I'm on a roll. So, okay. So we go down to the basic start now. This is what we want. We want pace, pitch, power, pause, phrase, and so we need and want all this. But how do we get it? What's the first thing you would need to be able to get all this? Be relaxed. Every time I say the word relax, I think of a giant amount of boxes. It's in there. <laughs> Relax. Uh, so it is important. Now, relaxation is a little tricky. Again, it's very personal. You know, I, I don't have to, like my husband always says, do yoga, you won't get so stressed. And nothing stresses me out. They're just hearing that. <laughs> so my poor husband is trying so hard to help me. And then here I'm like being a total bitch about it. So, I don't like we all go through that, you know, or if your parents tell you, get up on time, you know that's the right thing to do it because they've said it, now you'll do it the other way. So relaxation is finding out what works for you. For some people, it may be, again, uh, some people it may be sort of, you know, doing it like really last minute, like building up the stress and then putting your best in. For some people, it's like, You've got to be prepared well in advance. Now, I'll say something which is non-negotiable is learning the work has to be done early. If that is not done well in time, then your performance is going to suffer. Then if this is not personal uh, relaxation techniques. This is stupidity if you don't learn your work. Okay? So that, there's certain things like, you know, I mean, being responsible and then, then you enjoy your performance. If you don't learn it, you don't enjoy it as much. So allow yourselves to get back. A lot of you have come back after a break. And I think one of the things you really need to do is like be prepared so that then you can really like sail through it and enjoy it and, and experiment with it and play with it. Okay, that will only come if you actually done that. So be, be relaxed long term, be relaxed intermediate. Those who have an or no, I mean like normal, how many of you have acidity? Like your throats burn at night or in the morning. None of you? So, lucky. so obviously I'm one of those people who has acidity and it affects my throat. Because I get stressed. I get stressed even if I don't have stress. This is my personality. So I know that. So I need to take help for that. That's really long-term caretaking. If you're someone who you know doesn't need that, that too much, but maybe you're someone who needs to get stressed. Because otherwise your adrenaline may be too low. So then that's not very good either. You need, you need positive tension. Take away the negative tension, but you do need the positive tension. Otherwise, your energy will lack that, that little bit of that, that oomph that comes in. So I never get people coming into the exam completely relaxed. What you do need to do is do your voice warm-ups. Do our vowel sounds, do the tones, do, do all our exercises. It just firms up and gets the muscles ready. Oh, wow, that's a funny little sound. Miss? Um, yes, Nissa? Yes, Miss, I have another meeting. Can I please leave? Oh, Miss, you'll be putting this in the group, right? The recording. Oh, the recording is there. I'll put it on uh, YouTube and then put the link on the group. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Um, so you do need to get yourself well relaxed and please identify how you're getting yourselves relaxed. Again, this is something you want to talk about. When you're talking about how did you develop the program? How did you work for it? You know, this is where I would get tense. I asked my friends to take up my work and say it over and over again. I find that people giving up just before like, you know, take up my work before the exam, bad. Because if by chance you forget at that stage, you've come in with the fact that I just forgot. Oh my God, I'm going to forget this line. So the best thing to do at that stage is read it. Mm -hmm. So that you're, you're still doing the work, your mind, you know, because they're like, oh, distract yourself. And again, that's another thing that irritates me. It may work again for some people, but I can't get distracted. I don't want to get distracted. I want to focus on 
on the exam. So I read my work so that there's, you know, I don't get uh, worried about making a mistake or anything, but I'm still doing what I'm doing. And I'm not like going off into something else. Because I've seen people like chat to their friends about everything and then come in and do an absolutely fantastic performance. And I'm like, I'm getting nervous there and yet they're doing that, but that suits them. So you have to learn to find out what suits you and what won't distract you, okay? Once you're relaxed, you get into the correct posture. Show me the correct posture. Somebody. Stand up and you show me. Come here, come here, so that everyone can see you. Oh. Yeah. Too good. We need to move this back a bit like this. Yeah. Okay. So we've got Kanyaka here. Uh, she, we can't see all of her, but what is the correct posture? Shoulders back, then your chin up a little, not completely up, but normal. When you have proper eye contact and feet apart a little, it depends again. Yeah, to keep, give you balance. Yeah. yeah. So don't stand with your feet. You don't want to be standing, you know, if you look down. Uh, I don't want you standing like this. You are not a Darwan. But you don't want to be standing like this because then there's a tendency to fall. Okay. So you want to sort of have your feet apart, which is about shoulder, you know, your shoulder width down. Yeah. I find that that's the easiest way because that sort of tends to suit most people. But what you need to do is if you turn to the side, you see shoulders back back but it doesn't have to be for a, like you know stretched it doesn't have to be hard relaxed relax if you notice when we're doing the exam uh, exercise i tell all of you relax your shoulders and keep it back so firm and relaxed okay you don't want to be with have a lot of tension and have this stretch like that because then it'll affect your voice you can hear it the minute you relax it's so much easier but you don't want to be slouching okay so Shoulders back, firm, relax. Head, bums, heels, all in straight line, as if it's against an imaginary wall, because that gives you that sort of right, correct posture to move in things. Um, arms also relax by the sides. Try not to do the front and the back. That's very irritating. I just told Nisha, so she's laughing. I don't know how many of you remember. Don't put your hands in front. You don't want to go to school or potty. Yeah. So we've said that in class. We said that very often. Don't put your hand. Yes. Like, Nothing of that is happening. Okay. Hand by side and relax. And no fidgeting with your dresses. Who was doing it the other day? Uh, one of my fourth graders who had come for practice. And she kept like, she was doing everything so well. But the only thing was she kept like holding her dress. And I was like getting so irritated. So these are the little things, you know, keep yourselves relaxed and not fidgeting and things like that. So they feel that, oh, instead of fidgeting, it's better to put my hand in the back. No, learn not to fidget. I mean, I pronounce, uh, you know, very well wrong. So I'm never going to use very well. You can't do that. You have to learn how to do it correctly. Sit down. Thank you. So you've got that a little bit. Um, Get yourself in the correct posture when you're standing or sitting. And like she said, uh, the, the sort of the, the chin, for some reason in the, on the sheets, it's written perpendicular to the ground. And I realize not perpendicular, but this may be perpendicular, but it's actually parallel to the ground. Okay? So that you're not looking like, so I have lots of people performing, da -da 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 like up there, like, you know, performing as they're performing at the, in the Greek theaters or, or uh, you know, the Roman theaters or something like that, or an opera house. Uh, because they've got that big balcony on top. Or you got people who are like, na, 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 na. and it's like they're looking down. Hello. Look, eye contact with the audience, very important. That's another thing you want to talk about. So let's transition from there a little bit to eye contact before I go on to breathing. Um, eye contact for four, for your drama pieces, you have the fourth wall over here. So you are not performing with your audience. But when you're in your own thoughts and you're, and you're sort of there. So if you notice, I just look like I'm not looking at anyone. I'm not looking into the audience and thinking. I'm actually lost. So feel lost in your thoughts. Okay? The eyes will show that. But you keep the fourth wall very much in place. You're performing within this space. Even in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, when the narrator is there, I tell the teachers very often, just think about the fact that as if you've got the kids that the narrator is talking to, some of them are actually 
He's not narrating only to the audience and narrating to people on the stage. So try and have that feeling there, okay? So uh, that's for your drama pieces. For your poems, you are the instrument of the, of the writer. So it's almost as if the writer is looking through you, if you can get that sense of feeling of eye contact. So it's not gur gur ke dek ke kisi ko. It just goes and comes and you can be relaxed. And a little more long, line, long longer blinking, not, not blinking like that, but thinking like that, closing eyes and opening eyes, allowed in poetry. Narrative. When you're doing a prose, even if you're doing characters, you know, and then Diane said, oh, no, I'm not going to do it. I may be performing Diane, but I'm still telling you the story. So it's very clear that I'm performing Diane, okay? Uh, it doesn't have to be a complete caricature, but there are elements of that that come in automatically. So in a narrative, you actually talk with them, like, you know, and then you know, the ghost came to visit me. They got so scared. You know, whatever it is, but like actually sit down and tell the story, whatever you're doing. So eye contact in that is paramount, okay? So you've got all these sort of things. Uh, and so we come to breath. Breath is the essence of your voice and your performance. It's in eyes are the soul. I mean, eyes are the mirror of your soul. So it shows the emotions of breath will technically determine the brilliance of your performance. So eyes will determine the emotional brilliance of your performance, but breath will determine your uh, technical you know, superiority. So what happens is uh, the diaphragm, of course, is the main muscle. It's one of the strongest muscles in the body. Is it the strongest muscle? Or is that the tongue? Or is that the heart? I can never remember. But then it's the biggest muscle. Or something, no, it can't be the biggest muscle. But this diaphragm is something ist in the body. Now, you all know the process of, of breathing. I'm not going to go through it in detail. <clears throat> breathing for life is to get oxygen into your body and you know, supplement it with the rest of your organs and things like that. There's a tendency when you're breathing normally, which is called breathing for repose, to use your abdominal cap, the muscles, you are not using your stomach. They're like the stomach goes up and down. No, no, no. The muscles in your abdominal cavity help the muscles in your chest cavity for breathing at normal time. So when you're sleeping, it feels like the stomach is going up and down, but it's actually the diaphragm and a little bit in sympathy that the abdominal muscles move. But it's not really the abdominal muscles doing the breathing. But think about it logically. If the breath went into your stomach, then you've got holes in your lungs. <laughs> because the breath is supposed to go into your lungs, then go through the blood vessels into your body. So the actual air cannot go into the rest of your body. Okay? That's not what goes. It is sort of, I mean, I'm sure there's air within the body, and you know, uh, but it's not. The, the air that we actually breathe, okay? So when you when you uh, speak, uh, breathe for voice production, it's called intercostal diaphragmatic breathing. This is very important. You don't do clavicular breathing. You avoid abdominal breathing because when you're breathing for voice and you use your abdominal muscles, there is a chance that you might actually harm the organs in your abdominal cavity. If they put too much pressure because if you're screaming and you scream from here, you might actually, your stomach might hurt. You don't want to do that. So you've got to use your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles. Intercostal muscles are uh, between the rib cages, okay? Uh, sorry, between the ribs. Uh, does anybody remember how many ribs were? Five are attached to the sternum. You've got a dozen ribs, right? Two dozen are legs. attached to the spine. They're all attached to the spine. Uh, but then when they come forward, they there are two which are floating ribs. Yeah, floating. So the two bottom ones are floating. They don't attach to anything. You've got five which are on top, which leaves seven to... No. Which leaves five to attach to each other. Okay? So if you sort of see it, it goes... The sternum which protects your heart. So you've got ribs going one, two, three, 
four, five, going like that. I don't know, you all can't see it, no? Doesn't matter. <laughs> and then you've got the next five, this one attaching to this, this one attaching to this, this one attaching to this, this one attaching to this. How many did I do? One, two, three, four. We have this one attaching to this. Five. And then you've got two which are kind of floating in the air. As far as I know, these are the numbers. I'm not 100% sure. Let me see if I can get this. Can you see it? Like a rough drawing of it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, see. okay. So that's um, the whole. And between these are the intercostal muscles. Okay. Now, when you're breathing in, the muscles contract, they get tight. So the minute the muscles contract, they tighten up so the ribcage gets pulled out and the diaphragm flattens. So there's space in your body, the air rushes in. Of course, when you're doing it for life, it happens because the oxygenated blood is gone and the deoxygenated blood, you know, the, the carbon dioxide has come in and needs to be uh, exhaled. Um, but for voice, we're going to look at it slightly differently. The two work in tandem. Some, one of the examiners asked the kids, like, you know, so what happens to your breathing for life? And they said, it stops. <laughs> no, no, no. You'll be dead. It works in tandem. You need the breath for life and for voice. So anyway, it extends the air rushes in. So if you can develop your capacity, so our first exercise, you know, breathe in two, three, four, four, two, three, four, then breathe in two, three, four, five, six, then eight, then 10. You're actually expanding your little bronchial sacs as big as possible so they learn to take in more and more air. Okay? Then you uh, exhale. Then you learn to hold. Okay? And exhalation is controlled. How much breath, how fast is the breath going to come out? With what force and speed? You know, all that needs to be done, worked on, but it again happens almost instinctively because you experiment and then just practice with it, okay? Now, when the breath comes out, it acts like the pluck on a guitar or the finger, uh, the bow of the violin or any of these, you know, the, the, the vibrator. So it comes out and it vibrates the vocal cords. The vocal cords are cartilages. You take a balloon and you slit it, and what is left is what it will look like because a smaller version of it over here in your voice box. It comes, it vibrates, uh, you know, it obviously, as it passes through, it's shaken. So a sound is produced. The sound wave is produced. What you do with that sound wave is what everyone hears. So the quality of the sound, the resonance and the quality of the sound depends on your resonating cavity, which is your pharynx region, your oral and nasal region, okay? A little bit of the thoracic region also gets, comes into play here. That is basically pharynx, uh, oral and nasal cavities, okay? That gives you the quality of the sound. The actual words that you make, the, the consonant and vowel sounds come from the articulating organs which ones you've used and in what position, okay? Can you tell me, so this is basically breath. If you have control of this process, you'll have control over your spoken word brilliantly. Again, this is why we do as much as everybody's like, why do we do the exercises? This is why we do our exercises. And if any of you have any sense, go to do the exercises every morning at home. While you're lying in your shower, I said that very often because the uh, humidity gives you a little bit of lubrication, plus, you're not wasting any time. Okay, because warn everybody that you're not going nuts in the shower, but do it. Um, so, if we've got that, we've got the uh, breath control coming in. Now, can you tell me which our articulating organs are to form those words? This is seventh grade technically. Up to this was sixth grade, okay? For seventh graders, this is new. So which are our articulating organs? The mouth. The mouth. The tongue. 
down the 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 palate, the hard palate, and the soft palate. Then the hands, the uvula, also the epiglottis, the one that covers the the uh, windpipe. Okay, so the epiglottis, the little uvula, hard palate, soft palate, uh, teeth ridge over here, your teeth, lips, and the entire mouth. Also your nasal passages, uh, because murna, anga, all the nasal sounds come from there. Okay, so you've got all now all the consonant sounds are made by the use of some of the articulating organs. So you've got that in your book. Okay, grade seven. I will be doing this. Who's in grade seven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll be doing this again in your class per se alone because you need it in a little more detail than say the others. But in the articulating organs, sorry, in to, when we make the consonant sounds, it's a little bum this kind of. Uh, the in the consonant sounds, the articulating organs that we use have to be very precise. So we need to know per Papa, mama, baby. I, I, again, our exercises, by, which were formulated by my teacher, have been done very carefully, keeping in mind all our consonant sounds. So again, when you're talking about it, you say I developed it by doing I love pa pa, the explosion coming hard. Mama, again, lips, labels, they're all labels. They all use only the lips. But depending on how you're using it, one is a plosive, one is nasal. And burr is also a plosive, but it's unvoiced. Sorry, burr is unvoiced. Burr is, burr is voiced. You know, I'm getting confused. But one is voiced and one is unvoiced. Burr, burr. Voice, unvoiced. Burr is voiced, burr is unvoiced. Okay? And for each of these, you have six. Turdle, kurgle, churgle, burr, burr. I want all the seventh graders to open their, their handbooks and read the consonant sounds and the vowel sounds very carefully. Now, I'm being honest, they're not going to ask you. You know, I, I mean, in the exam, if it was a live exam, they could maybe say that, how do you make per, how do you make per? They don't do that anymore. But they do want to know that you understand articulation overall. So for consonant sounds, which is the main form of your articulation, you have to have the correct use of your articulating organs, and therefore you can give examples. Like burr, burr. In India, we tend to make a mistake with that. Burr, burr, burr uses the upper teeth and the lips. So having an idea and mentioning that makes, you know, and it's good and useful to know that as you're listening to others performing also, okay? So you have your particular artic uh, articulating organs that are used properly, whether it's voiced or unvoiced, burr, burr, tur, duh. Voiced or unvoiced is here. If it's voiced, this will vibrate. If it's unvoiced, this won't vibrate so much. Okay? So that's a perber, turdo, kurgo, chojo, lura, mono. They've got all these combinations. It's in the list over there. Just go through it a little bit. Okay? Uh, so you've got voiced and unvoiced. You've got uh, the uh, organs of articulation and the quality of sound that the consonant sounds produce. So the quality of sound is whether it's a hard, explosive sound, whether it's a sibilant and goes slowly. Because in a consonant sound, the breath is held behind the closed organs for a second. And when released, what happens to the sound, whether it comes out slowly, whether it comes out through what kind of an opening is what makes the consonant sound. So you need to know that to make sure you're making the consonant sounds correctly. The r, the l, the h, aspirates, the ones which use breath, y, h, okay? So we need to know all these things a little bit. Like I said, I don't want you to have to learn the whole thing. We make, normally we tend to make a chart of it and I'll do that in class with you. So we all would go through this, the seventh graders would go through it in the book. I will sit quickly in class for about 20 minutes and make the chart with all of you, just so that you have a general idea of this in the next class. But go through it. Don't make me just make the chart. 
So if you're like, kind of got it, keep your books open. We can actually refer to that and do it. So that's your consonant sounds. Your vowel sounds is your enunciation. Oh, we make it in time. Is your enunciation. And it has a flow. It gives a flow to the language. Okay. And Indians tend to mispronounce a lot of words because of incorrect vowel sounds. Today, again, somebody I was taking for practice. And I said, Lavanya, I think it was. Yeah, surprisingly, uh, she tends to shorten all the long vowel sounds. How many vowel sounds do we have? Single vowel sounds. Five. I killed you. She Seven. did this last year. Seven. Single vowel sounds. How many do we do in the exercises? Single Seven. long vowel sounds. Two, O, O, A, A, E, O. That's A, not F. Okay? A. These are seven long vowel sounds. Six short vowel sounds. Oh, 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 ah, eh, eh. So how many single vowel sounds do we have? Six. Uh, really? We just said that how many vowel, single vowel sounds do we have? Thirteen, yeah. Seven long, six short. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like so depressed after saying this. I'm like, what are you all listening to? Um, 13 single vowel sounds. After that, we have them in combinations of twos or threes. Combinations of twos, they're called diphthongs, mm -hmm. and the flow has to be seamless. I, who, out. The flow from one vowel sound to the other must go very, very seamlessly. Okay, the glide has to be very smooth. Don't say out. Let's be out. All right. And trip songs are a combination of three vowel sounds. The third vowel sound in the concept in the in the trip songs are is the neutral vowel. No, and not all, but for most of them, it's the neutral vowel. Okay. Again, for seventh grade, we list it out and go through that. In the next, I don't want to keep doing technicals every session, all the sessions. So we'll just touch on this a little bit. The actual consonant sounds and the actual vowel sounds. So one session consonant sounds, next session vowel sounds, just so that you have a little more detail. Grade eight and eight, uh, ATCF, you don't need to know every vowel sound, but it's good to remind yourselves of it. Okay? You're going to say? Yeah, I'm going. Uh, this, this one, I I'll give you more. Oh. Anybody scared of cats here? The end is you don't like cats. Like cat. Also tomorrow five months. Yeah. yeah. Why? Just because I just give it. We have to leave by five thirty, no? What? I'll talk to my next. But five o'clock I'm putting my alarm. Just give it to me. Anything else? <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, guys. It was a cat emergency. Uh, if you'll help me adopt these kittens, we won't have these problems. Um, actually, I'll send it out to everybody, but we need it. Right. So, getting back to vowel sounds. So, we might be five minutes late now. Uh, <laughs> You've got, uh, where was that? Yeah. So the vowel sounds, need, uh, the, the neutral vowel brings to an end most of the trip thongs, which are three position vowel sounds. Okay. What are the, what's the neutral vowel? Does anybody remember? Eighth graders? The Y. The Y. The No, it's normally shown. Um, there are two ways they're shown. One is the opposite E, and or it's sort of like this. For some reason, they show it in these two sort of symbols. I'll bring it up here. Right. I thought it was the upside down E. Uh, yeah, it's sort of like an odd thing. No, yeah, normally it's the the mirror image E. Um, that that's maybe the symbol for it. But what exactly is the neutral vowel? Aisha. 
So it's the shortening of a normal balsa. It's a shortening of the a. Uh. It's not just a. Uh. No, it's anything like o also, right? Yeah, no, no. But what I mean is, it's a sh uh is a balsa. Huh, sorry. Okay. I mean, it's the shortening. Short, yeah, it sounds like a shortened or weakened form of a. Uh. But basically, it's any vowel sound when you don't say the vowel sound. So you don't say postman. You say postman. Man. 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 Okay? So you just go uh. That shortening or weakened form of a uh, uh, is what is the neutral vowel. Now what happens again, going back to emphasis. There is one syllable in the word that is emphasized and the vowel is said in the whole form. But then the other syllables, the vowel sounds are neutralized. You just say it as a, uh, okay? So catastrophe, catastrophe. The last one maybe is a short e, okay? But even that's sort of a very weak vowel sound. So you sort of neutralize a lot of the vowel sounds in the spoken language. Even when you say, uh, you know, when there are repeated words, that the uh the that so the first that is neutralized that that was the case that that was the case um a lot of words completely can be neutralized when they're one syllable words because they're the unimportant words again this comes because english is a tonal tuned language so we need to have that movement coming in and that comes in by making it stronger or weaker in you know the emphasis that you give it okay so the neutral vowel is a very 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 important part of the english language it gives the language its musicality its cadences its flow i've given you the description the, the definition of the neutral vowel also so please read all the notes i've given you and read the handbook it becomes very important to incorporate these two now when you're performing your articulation and your enunciation must be flawless. And that's why a big part of what we are is speech and drama. Because otherwise people will get distracted. You know when you read Chetan Bhagat's book, for some reason he believes in not correcting mistakes. So while I'm reading the book, I get irritated by the mistakes that are in it, the grammatical and spelling mistakes. I mean, spell check should check it. Why is he leaving it wrong? But whatever rocks is for. Uh, but it irritates me when I'm reading it. And that's what happens very often. If you mispronounce a word or you give the wrong articulation, enunciation, and pronunciation, and or pronunciation, you know, that's what sticks with the audience rather than everything else. Which is why I tend to correct words like comfort. And I remember my, my problem uh, was uh, idea. I used to say idea wrong. I don't know what I said, but I remember that that was my word where I needed to correct my my thing. And there was another one which I used to say incorrectly when I was a student of speech and wrong. Uh, my teacher used to go around the bend correcting me with it. Um, and I remember idea, but there was another one. And two of them that I sort of like tended to emphasize and correct. So we all have it. Uh, there are, there's no harm, like for instance, when you were doing harbinger, somebody speaks, we sort of talked about harbinger. If you're not sure of the pronunciation, it's okay to look it up. Just make sure you're looking it up. And then, you know, you have lots of these sites on YouTube and everything that just give you pronunciation. Loose, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, is uh, this one here? My sixth, seventh grade, uh, Dia, is Dia here? No, it was in Dia's pieces that we were surprising because she asked people to leave. Um, in the years pieces, we sort of uh, had a few words that we weren't sure of. So we, you know, looked it up. Very important to do that. Nobody knows every single word and everything. So if you have a slight of doubts, look it up. It's a Luciana. Luciana. So Luciana, I thought it was Luci because it's Italian. And then we decided to go with the Anglican version of things. So... But we looked it up and you had all these pronunciations that were given. You know, even for names, darlings, you know, this, this stupid ass, especially during our time, there was this thing. Oh, it's a proper noun. You can pronounce it any way you want. No! You can give it the different formats. 
the new hands. So that's why one of the reasons I love Mumbai being called Bombay was because a city like ours had so many different names in every different language, whether it was Mumbai or Bombay or Bombay. Ironically, in Hindi, they still call it Bombay. They don't say Mumbai in Hindi. So I don't understand where the... But sometimes there are some one name, people pronounce it in two different ways. Yeah, so you have to find out in that context what suits it. So like I'm saying, Luciana. Do I pronounce it Luciana or do I pronounce it Luciana? Because, uh, you know, both are correct. And it is an Italian for a name. I mean, set in a team. So do I say it in the authentic Italian? We know because it's a British place. So they've, they've anglicized. So I need the Anglican pronunciation of that. It's like when you say Hima, you know, people get upset and say, oh, when you're stalking and don't say Him Himalayas, say Himalay. Then if I'm saying uh, a poem by, uh, what's that, uh, uh, Edward Arnold, and I say Himalay, it just sounds stupid and sounds wrong. It was meant the way he chose his words was to go with Himalaya. So then you say it like that. So then it, it doesn't mean you're being, you know, uh, racist or things like that. It just means it's like Himalaya you know, because it's an Indian story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now it depends. Like if, it not, if it's a novel today, written, a modern novel written by a modern Indian writer, he might actually be thinking of it and, and therefore will write it in Himalayas. So into the Himalayas, that's okay. So then say it like that. I mean, if I was doing, uh, you know, um, what is Amitabh Ghosh and all their, their Devendra Pat, uh, that Patnaik's books, I would use the Indianized versions of things because that's how he wrote it. So that's why again, research becomes so important. How are you going to actually pronounce it? And then you take it, you know, a little bit of it is instinct. You sometimes don't know everything. So you then sort of go with it as it flows and seems right to you. Okay. So there's that always that little bit of uncertainty to things. Uh, so this is the whole comprehensive package of your technicals that you need to be able to talk about. All the printouts that you need are given to you. Okay. Blank verse is here also because seventh grade needs blank verse. Uh, just a quick recap of what is uh, blank verse. Meter, yeah. So we actually we're not touched on meter for technical, very important, especially again for those in seventh grade, but I think all the grades, meter is the rhythm with which we speak. Every word has, like again, English has a heavy syllable and a light syllable. And this is a combination of these syllables that give you your meter. Now, even prose will have a meter, but it may not be something um, that, you know, we are absolutely, um, where is meter? We can get it out. Um, it may not be so obvious. It may not be so repeated in prose, but in verse, verse form. Oh, that's got meter 160 inch 160. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, if you look at it over here on page 163 uh, of the handbook, you can see over here they've given the little mark to give you the emphasized syllable. And those are very often the heavier syllables. Okay. Now, when it follows a certain pattern, so for instance, with, with Shakespeare and with the English of that time, the written work at that time, they followed the iambic pattern. Now, they followed it five times, it became iambic pentameter. Iambic is, what is the beat? Light him. okay? The quality of mercy is not strain, okay? So light, heavy, light, heavy, light, heavy, five times. So having the beats repeated five times gives you the iambic pentameter. Blank verse is verse poetry written with the iambic pentameter and there is no rhyme scheme. 
when you don't have a rhyme scheme it's three verse okay if it but if it's iambic pentameter with uh, no rhyme scheme it's a defined blank verse otherwise it becomes free verse and then you extend free verse and have a very vague um, meter form then it's spoken word and i don't know how in which category to place spoken word uh, the people who do spoken word are very clear that it's poetry um i think it's a combination it's like a crossover doesn't mean it's right or wrong it just doesn't i don't don't think it actually just fits into a particular cat category but if you look at meter so you have and when you have a combination it's called a foot so you can have an iambic foot which is light heavy you can have a trochee which is heavy a heavy light that's the foot then spondy is too heavy uh, anapest is light light heavy and dactyle is heavy light light okay it's nice to kind of know about this but again those who are doing shakespeare sonnets or whatever else i am think pentameter becomes very important please when you are doing the analysis of your pieces try and find out the meter a little bit so you can talk about it in your interpretation okay so add that a little bit into your your analysis okay now grade 7 8 and atcl whenever the atcl does the exams um start writing your responses to the four quest four questions that you're going to choose and write answers to uh aisha has a lot of questions and i would like aisha to go through them but she can't go through them if you give it to her right at the end towards the time of the exams so these questions your reflection task is not going to change the only thing is going to change is the piece that you analyze you know the unseen passage and we'll go back to that a little bit this year we need to go back to that a little bit um so 7th and 8th grade has the unseen passage atcl you all have it it's a piece of cake uh in the digital exam you have one set of questions that five minute talk that is given to you and then you got your reflection questions which are not framed very well but you will need to sort of create the best out of that which means do a lot of research understand your technicals put it together then you'll want to put it into these reflection tasks so don't be like i've got this question okay now let me find the answer and put it in do the research and then fit in things so that your questions have that depth into in them okay but start doing it start giving sort of uh, quick answers sending it to aisha and me so that she can give you the feedback but it's not fair for aisha because she's got you are all my students she needs to uh, you know handle her own kids and take their extra practice so make sure that you all got uh uh so i go and back it uh yeah so go write start writing at least points for the answers framing them sort of you know uh, a little bit uh rule of thumb about 100 words a minute uh yeah i guess depends on how time is because you don't want the responses to go beyond the stipulated time given which i think is 5 minutes for everybody except you see um they have given you and yes it's mentioned i put it right there so just be very careful about that and if it says one and a half minutes per answer yeah you want to equally divide your time but one might be you know 45 seconds and the other one so much more it's okay but overall the time should go over and which is why i also want you to record your pieces this week darlings we've not had class but this week urgently i need all of you please somebody put it on all your groups um record all your three pieces you can do it individually it doesn't have to be continuous like we do for the exam but send it to me if you do it together it's easier email it to me google drive it to me whatever it to me that it comes but let it come to me so that i can have a look more than anything else for time because people have been penalized for going over time okay now when you have someone who's got 94 and you then get 93 or you're going to get 98 and you get 94 still it's okay you never knew 
I mean, I remember Monel, one of my students, went over time for his talk. Barry Prince, may his soul rest in peace, uh, wrote over there, I am minusing five marks for his, because his talk went over time. And he had doubled the time. It was five minutes, he had talked for 10 minutes. So he, he actually minused five marks, which meant he went from a 90 something to an 88 or an 89. And that broke his heart. You know, so you don't want that to be happening. Okay, so we need to make sure that it all falls within that time. So if you've learned your pieces and recorded, I'll be ecstatic. But I'm not an idiot. I don't live in fool's paradise. I know that a lot of you haven't learned all your pieces. So hold the paper for whatever else you need to, but send the recordings now with a good performance because the performance will give it the right timing. If you just read it, I won't get the timing. So I need you to perform it. So at least that much to hold. So practice the performances and then record it and send it. But by Sunday, I want everyone's performance from every grade so that I can see the timings, okay? And start answering the reflection questions because this was aimed at getting the reflection questions started. Uh, darling, they got a bit of a shock because uh, Trinity College called me and said, uh, oh, well, I actually called for one of my students and I found out that I was late in paying the exam fees for the communication skills students. So if they, they are going, you know, um, in September, October, I'll have them, I was hoping to sort of separate out from skills and speech and drama and things. But if we're now all going together, I will need to work with everyone together, which means we have, uh, I would like to send most of you your fees up by about the middle of September so that, uh, so I start collecting beginning of September so that you can do the exam at the beginning of October. Okay, most of you, I'd like you to go at the beginning of October. And I think all of you can work at it if you really, really put your heart and soul into it. And you can enjoy it in the process, you know? Don't just do it. Really, all of you are here because you enjoy it, so keep that going. Um, so I'd like more or less everything done by the end of August so that you've got the rest of the month to really practice. Please remember, if I take everybody for half an hour, I'm still taking, you know, I'm doing over 40 hours. So, and then I take my other teachers, students also. So I'm back to working like 50, 60 hours a week, which is what I didn't want to be doing. So please make sure your work is done so that I can take the practices quickly and they fit in that half an hour. Because your exam is half an hour. So let me just hear it in, in that half an hour, the whole thing. Okay, so get cracking, just like really, really, just imagine the exam is uh, end of August. And just work with it. Meaning, you know, I'm going back to what we used to do in initial grade. Mood, genre, meaning of words, especially again, Shakespeare. You need to know what it all means. Go through that, all the background work, everything. Just do the entire, work. you'll know what you need to do. So get on with it, okay? For those of you, we still need to choose the third pieces. We'll have to do that. Like really, otherwise you, you will be in serious trouble. So you are allowed to hound me for that. Okay? Are we talking about something? Okay, so we just need some other Even if we don't work around it. Okay. So are we all done? Got it? Has anything gone in? You're sure anybody has any questions? Well, I've understood everything. Either I'm brilliant or you're not listening to anything. <laughs> so, combination of the two. Um, but if you have any questions, put it down in the group because your questions may be something the others also have. So, go through the technicals, keeping in mind your pieces. And then, if you have any questions, message me. And like I said, message it on the group. Okay? Got it, darling? So I'll see you soon. Uh, I'll call you out for some extra practice somehow or the other. I think I've got to still finish some of my fourth graders and fifth graders who didn't turn up. My fifth graders didn't turn up because uh, the message I forwarded was from my fourth grade batch. 
and uh, so it said for 